love and now I'm laying it at your feet Every failure, God, you have every victory. your children that would separate us from your love. So help us to walk, to take that step of faith. No matter what kind of father we had growing up, Lord, you are a good father. You are a loving father. You're looking out for every one of your children, and we are your children. You call me out upon Oceans rise, my soul will rest. 
And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet. like you to say hello real quick for you that are here in person say hello to one another you can do a curtsy a bow last week we did a little chicken dance action but just say hello and if you also are streaming here today log in and say hello to those that are watching from home well hello good morning gay city vineyard and today we want to especially welcome our wonderful fathers who are here this morning. And I think that Gay City Vineyard really has some wonderful, special fathers who really take care of their family and are really wonderful to their kids. And uh, it's an, they're an example, I think, of what Jesus loves is like. They accept their kids, they love them. And I think that we have a lot of those here. And so welcome. And for those of you watching from home, welcome as well. And we're missing you, but we know that you have to be at home, but welcome. And uh, let's say a prayer together, okay, this morning before Pastor Todd gets here. And um, we want to pray for our fathers this morning, okay? So, Father, we come before you and thank you. Thank you for the wonderful fathers that you have at Gay City Vineyard and in this country and most of all to you for being our wonderful spectacular father 
and to be the perfect father. Even if we didn't have perfect fathers growing up, you are our perfect father. And we thank you for being with us here this morning. We thank you for the wonderful weather that you've given to us in the last three Sundays to be out here together and to worship you and to hear the sermon together. And we ask that you please bless everyone here and everyone watching at home and that everybody just continues to remain connected and to continue to have you be the center of our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Wonderful. I, I don't know if you guys can see this. I just want to clarify something. Even though it's a little bit warmer than it was last Sunday, I, I'm not sweating profusely. I don't know if you can see this. I actually spilled some water back over there when I was doing the lyrics. So I just wanted to clarify that. So anywho, good to see everybody. I want to say thank you for those who are joining in with us online. And um, as we get into the message here this morning, um, I think that we would all agree that 2020 has been one heck of a difficult year. Can I get a hallelujah? And, and for those of you who are watching at home, maybe you want to type in, you know, a virtual hallelujah. Amen, brother. I think we would all agree that this so far has been one doozy of a year. And so... What I want to do at the beginning of what I'm going to share here this morning is I want us to do a, a recap. And, and this is going to be obvious, I think we all know this, but, but humor me here. So early to mid-March of this year, a majority of the world was on lockdown because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I know we all already know that. And so many people lost so much. Some people lost loved ones, others lost their income, some lost their jobs, some lost their businesses, and all of us lost a sense of normalcy to where we, we begin asking, and I think that we're still asking ourselves, what is the world going to be like going forward? Now, what's interesting is that many times a crisis will have a unifying effect. A crisis can oftentimes bring people together. For example, September 11th, 2001, when terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers and, and into the Pentagon, there was a unification of people in this country. The unification of people in our country, it was surging. Young and old, rich and poor, people from all different walks of life and colors, they were saying, no, this is, this is our country. This, this is our nation. You, you can't hijack planes and plow them into tall buildings, killing thousands of people. You can't do that. We are standing together as one nation and one people. But unfortunately, COVID-19 has seemed to have the opposite effect. It, it, instead of this unifying us as a nation, it, it seems to be that, that we are becoming more divided over this. It, it's, it's more divisive. It, instead of people uh, becoming together, standing together, we're becoming more polarized. And it feels like there's a divide between two different people groups where one group says, yes, this, this is serious, we, we, we need to be wise about this, but if I, I wonder if shutting down the economy may actually be even more painful and, and have even more of a negative impact than, than not shutting down. And then on the other side, it seems like it's, it's no, no, it, it's completely irresponsible, it, it's reckless to reopen. Again, there's a lot of division over this. When churches across the country began canceling meetings, there were many in the church, and when I say church, I mean Big C Church, but when churches began to cancel, there were many that were saying, no, 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 you need to keep the churches open. Where's your faith? You don't have enough faith. You need to stick it to the government. Don't let the government tell the churches what to do. You need to stay open. And then as churches began opening back up, some have said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You're, you're risking lives. 
Again, there, there, there's so much tension, there's so much discord, and then when things couldn't have gotten any worse, our nation experienced the, the tragic deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, and this brought to the forefront of our attention the ongoing issue of racism. And then suddenly there's more anger, there's, there's more discord, and there's more division. Now, with all of this that has taken place in our world, in our country, in our lives over the past few months, it would be my guess that the devil is laughing his full head off. It would be my guess that he is rejoicing, that he is celebrating over all of the discord and all of the disunity that is taking place. And one of the reasons for this is because one of his greatest tactics, one of his greatest strategies is to sow discord and to divide, especially when it comes to the family of God. Because when as Jesus followers, when the family of God, when we are united together in mission, when we come together and we rally around our Lord and Savior, we are powerful. There is an anointing that God brings and pours out when we stand together united in mission and in purpose and in heart. But when we're divided, we quickly become weak. We become ineffective and even overlooked. Now, for our time here this morning, what I want to do is I want us to consider a few things that will help foster and to help build unity in the body of Christ. And so I'm going to go ahead and start with the first scripture here this morning. If you're following from home, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church. He says this, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. And when Paul says, I appeal, he's saying, I beg you. He is saying, I urge you. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, if Paul's appeal for, for a unification and being united in the church, in the cause, in the mission of Jesus, if, if Paul's appeal isn't enough, then listen to the prayer of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Listen to the cry of his heart as he prays to the Father. Jesus in John 17, verses 20 through 21, he says, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, so that they may be brought to complete unity, so that everyone in the body of Christ may be unified, that they would be unified in the mission, in the truth, in the life of Jesus. And why does Jesus say this? He says it's because of this. Then the world will know that you sent me, God, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, listen, when the body of Christ rallies together, when the body of Christ unifies, it actually shows and it presents to the world a, a, a truth and a vision about who Jesus is, that Jesus actually really came from the Father, from heaven down to earth. And so when we stand united, folks, when we stand together, when we stay strong, resisting the tactics and the schemes of the devil, we can help usher in God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul prayed that we would be united. Jesus prayed that we would be united. What if we could be the generation that answered the Apostle Paul's in Jesus' prayers, that we would come together, unified, standing together with our Lord and Savior in, in the purposes that he calls us to do. Folks, one of the biggest prayers that you and I can be praying right now as individuals and as a church, especially considering the current climate that our culture is in, we should pray, God, help us to unite. Help the church 
come together in one heart, one mind, one voice, in one mission. Help us to stand together. Now, of course, the million dollar question is, how do we do this? How do we become one? What would it take for the church to come together and unite around the truth and the mission of Jesus? What would it take for the church to do this? And to be, to be honest with you guys, the answer is quite simple. So I'm going to give us two answers here this morning, two things for us to consider that will help foster you in our country. One enemy, the Apostle Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, folks, our battle is not against other people. Paul goes on, but it's against the rulers, it's against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, folks, we have to understand that the church down the street that reads from a different version of the Bible, or, or they express worship in a different way than we do, they are not the enemy. I'm getting ready to meddle on some toes here. Meddle in some people's business here. The person who votes differently than I do or who votes differently than you do, they are not my enemy and they are not your enemy. The person with a different skin color, they are not your enemy. Someone who dresses different, someone who has a difference of opinion, someone who has different thoughts, and speaks differently than you do or I do, they are not our enemy. We have one enemy, and this enemy has been given many names and titles. Titles like the Prince of Darkness, the Prince of the Power of the Air, Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, the Ruler of Demons. He is the Accuser. He is the Deceiver. He is the God of this fallen present age. He is the angel of the abyss. He is the destroyer. He is the serpent of old. He is the dragon, or as we commonly refer to him as the devil or Satan. And all of these names, they point to his evil character and his intent towards God and his people. Jesus in John 10.10 10 describes his character and his intentions like this. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Folks, the devil wants to steal our unity. He wants to kill our churches. He wants to destroy our witness as a light into a very dark world. Why? Because if you and I, if we stand united... If we come together and we stand united in the mission that God has called us to be, I believe that we will be unstoppable in showing the love, the grace, and the mercy, and the truth of Jesus Christ in a lost and hurting, broken world. Can you say amen? Amen. Folks, one of the strongest unifying forces is a common enemy that unites us we have one enemy think about it like this how many of you have brothers and sisters how many of you growing up ever fought with your brothers and sisters right you grow up you have brothers and sisters they drive you crazy you drive them crazy you, you may put their head in the toilet you know and try to drown them you, you may you know throw mud in their face or you, you pick on them they pick on you you annoy them they annoy you you can barely tolerate each other until someone else starts messing around with your brother or your sister and then you realize wait a minute blood is always thicker you ain't gonna do that to them I may be able to mess around with them, but you are not going to mess around with them. Folks, we need to understand that the devil is attacking the body of Christ. The devil is attacking our nation. And if we realize that we have a common enemy, that will help to unite us to where you and I stand up and say, Oh, wait a minute. I see what you're doing, devil. 
I see what you're trying to do. I see the seeds of destruction and discord that you are trying to sow, and you are not going to do that. I rebuke you. I'm going to pray against you, and I'm going to choose to stand united with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are not going to let you divide us any more. What will it take for us to unite in the body of Christ? Number one, recognizing that we have one enemy. And then secondly, recognizing that we have one mission. The mission unites us. Folks, what did Jesus say after he suffered and died on the cross and he went into a tomb and then three days later he rose from the grave and, and as he was getting ready to ascend into heaven, Jesus gives his disciples their assignment. He says, this is your calling. Here's your mission. And Jesus said this in Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, therefore go. Everybody say, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Folks, Jesus says, listen, if you're my follower, if you're a part of my church, this is what you do. This is a part of who you are. This is what you stand for. This is the calling of the church, that we go out into the world to fulfill the mission for which we were created, one mission to help people come to know the life-giving love and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But, unfortunately, especially today, this is often what the church is not known for. If you were to ask the average Joe or the average person out on the street, when you think of the church, what comes to mind? What are the things that pop in your mind when you think of the church? I would guarantee you a good number of those people that you would ask on the street, they would start to talk about and answer that question in regards to what we are against. Oh, they don't like this. Or they don't like that. They don't go there. They don't associate with that kind of person. If you don't look this way, talk this way, walk this way, dress this way, then you're just not going to be welcome there. But folks, what if we Jesus followers, what if we were known for what we are for? Guys, think of the values that, that Jesus calls us to, to build our lives upon. Values like love. How many of you here, when people think of you, would, how many of you would like for them to think of you? You know what? They're a loving person. How many of you would like to be known for grace, for being graceful? How many of you would like to be known for being merciful, being truthful, being for justice, being for compassion? Folks, that's what we're called to be known for. That, that, those values should be our calling cards. People should say of us as followers of Christ, you know what, I may not agree with what everything that they say, but my goodness, those Christians sure know how to love people. Those followers of Jesus sure know how to be merciful. They sure know how to be graceful. They know how to stand up for the truth. They know how to work for justice. They are compassionate, and they're even fun to be around sometimes. Folks, the Bible gives us one example and one example only of how the world will know that we are followers of Jesus. Jesus put it like this in John 13, verses 34 through 35. He says this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I think most of us know here this word that Jesus uses for love here is the Greek word what? I know you know this, Tim. Agape. It's the Greek word agape. And agape, it is a self-giving, self-sacrificial kind of love. It's a kind of love that isn't born out of emotions or feelings or attraction, but rather it's volitional. It's a choice. It's a kind of love that is concerned and works for the greatest good of another. 
And folks, this is the kind of love that God loves us with. God's love isn't sentimental. No, God loves from an outpouring of who he is because God himself is this kind of love, this self-giving, self-sacrificial, volitional kind of love. And folks, Jesus calls us to love each other and to love our neighbor with this kind of love where we choose to work for the highest good of another. And I think that we all realize that this kind of love does not come naturally to us, but folks, it does come naturally to God. And the more that you and I experience, the more that you and I rest in, think upon, experience the love of God, the closer that we draw to Him, the more that He fills us up with His kind of love, then folks, that it's easier for us to express the kind of love because we're taking it in and they were called to give it out. And folks, it's going to take this kind of love, this type of self-giving, self-sacrificial kind of love that is going to help to overcome the kind of divisions and discord that we're seeing in our country today. Paul goes on and says this in Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. Paul says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ with one voice and one mind to share the mission of Jesus. How do we do that? When you think of the body of Christ, when you think of all the different kinds of people that make up the body of Christ, how do we do that? How do we stand united? Paul goes on to say how we do this in verse 7. Paul says, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. How many of you want to bring glory to God? Paul just told us one of the ways that we do this is that we accept one another. And folks, let me say this. To accept another person does not mean that you have to agree or approve of everything that person says and does. There are actually... Two different things, acceptance and approval, are two different things. Let me read for you some of the thoughts of uh, Christian sociologist Larry Crabb about this, describing the differences between approval and acceptance. He says this, very relevant to our day and time. We live in a world of extremes. The middle ground is losing ground, whether it be politics or sports fandom. We have turned affection into a binary endeavor, love or hate. One of the side effects to this is we're losing a perspective about the difference between acceptance and approval. In modern society, they are one and the same. Withholding approval is tantamount to full-out rejection of one's identity, but there is a difference. Acceptance is about identity. It is the stronger of the two the more significant, the most real. Why? Because it is easier and clearer. None of us has the market cornered on approval. We approve things we shouldn't and vice versa. We are as imperfect as the thing that we judge to be imperfect. We can't trust our appraisal system. Acceptance is easy because it is all-encompassing. There is no discernment when it comes to acceptance, just obedience, the laws of God and man. Morality and common sense say that we ought to accept each other without bias. When I was born, my dad dreamed of me playing in the NBA. It was his favorite sport, but I ended up being pretty good at soccer, a sport he knew little about. He accepted it with no real obstacle, but it was hard to let go of his dream for me. These kinds of things happen all the time. Good parents who love their children don't approve of a choice in spouse or a major in college or an overseas move. That The mistake that both parent and child make in these scenarios is demanding that it has to be all or nothing. The key to healthy disapproval is twofold, humility and unwavering acceptance. We are allowed to express our disapproval, but when it negates our ability to accept, we have a big problem. We have to be able to separate the two to have either of them mean anything. In a strange way, room for healthy disapproval makes acceptance more possible. 
It follows the agree to disagree posture, the love one another even if we don't see eye to eye perspective. Our world needs more of this. We need to separate our need for approval from our need for acceptance because there are two distinct things and understanding each in its own right will help us to both accept and approve according to the truth rather than our defensive predispositions. Amen. Amen. Folks, again, we don't have to approve or agree with everything in order to accept one another and to accept our fellow man. Now, when Paul calls us to accept one another, the way that it's written in the Greek, it means to open your arms. It, it, it means to embrace. It means to take another person in your life. Again, you don't have to completely agree with somebody to say, you know what? You are loved. Jesus loves you. I accept you. You matter. You are important. Come on in. We're going to do life together. Even though we may not agree with everything, we're still going to walk together through this. And so again, how do we do this? The Paul, Paul tells us, he says, accept one another just as Christ Jesus accepted you. You don't have to answer this out loud, but folks, even though Jesus accepted you, do you think that Jesus always agrees or approves of everything that you do or say? Nobody going to answer that? <laughs> of course he doesn't always approve of everything you say or do, or me either, but he still accepts you as you are. Paul tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us, died for the unrighteous, and that he accepted us. So again, one, one of the things, I'm going to close with this. So three things, three things that we can do that would begin to help us to foster unity, to foster our togetherness in the body of Christ. One being, again, folks, that we have one common enemy. We don't fight against flesh or blood, folks. Your enemy is not your fellow man. Your enemy is the devil who wants to sow discord and hatred amongst the people of God and amongst God's pre-creation. So we have one enemy that we fight against. We also have one mission that we rally around to share the love and the truth of who Jesus is. And then another thing that will help us is that we can begin with the help of the Holy Spirit to accept one another without having to agree or approve of everything that we say or do. As the worship team comes back up, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray right now for our country, Father. We pray for the church of Jesus Christ because with all the division that's starting to take place within our country, I see a lot of the church becoming divided as well. And Father, we pray right now for Gate City Vineyard Church. We pray for our fellow brothers and sisters, the Big C Church. Father, this is a moment that we have as the body of Christ, as your church, to be a light to, to a dark world. Father, I pray that, that with all the things that are going on in the world, with all the discord and, and, and just you know anger and, and intensity, Father, I pray that you would help us to have eyes to look be behind flesh and blood and to see that our fellow man is not our enemy, but we have one enemy. And Father, I pray that as a church that when we see the, the effects, when we see you know, the seeds of the devil, in what he's sowing, Father, I pray that you would help us to pray and that we would rebuke and that we would push back and that we would pray against what he's trying to do in our nation, in our churches, and in the world. And Father, we thank you that it's not big devil, big God, but rather it's big God, little devil. Father, I pray that again that you'd give us the strength to pray against the wiles and the attacks of the enemy, that we would stand together Father, I pray that in the midst of everything that's going on, I pray that you would help us to be unified with the mission that you've given us to go into the world, to share your love, to share your goodness, to share your truth, to share your gospel. 
Help us not to forget that we're, we're unified up with that and by that. And Father, I pray that you would also help us to accept one another in the same way that you have accepted us. Father, help this season, this day, and this time that we're in. Help your church to stay united and to come together, one mind, one voice, one cause, one heart, to lift you up. Jesus, you are the answer to all the things that are happening in our world. You can heal COVID-19. You can just put the snap of your finger. Father, we pray for healing. Father, we pray that you would heal the racial divide in this country, that you would help us as your people to speak up for truth. And Father, help us to be known as people who love people, who extend grace and mercy and truth and compassion. Help us to exhibit your spirit and your fruit to those that we come in contact with. Come around, Father, and in our church where we work, where we shop, Father, help us to be your hands and your feet and to be a light. And Father, even though the devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy, Jesus, you said that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, as your people, we stand on your truth. We stand on your promises. And we love you and we thank you. And I pray that as we sing this last song, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would meet us right where we're at. Holy Spirit, I pray for those who are watching online. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in their living rooms and in their kitchens. Father, even though we're not all together in one space, we're still all one church. And I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would unite us all together. And Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we pray and we ask these things in the name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship, folks. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my fortress. You are my hiding place. I believe that you are. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. The mercies and them, with the mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to. We can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with the mercies that are new. And doubts, they can all come to. Cause I can't stay long when I believe that you are the way. Sing it out, church, the truth, the truth, the life. I believe that you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe that you are. Have a great week, church. Everybody, before you get out of here, make sure you say happy birthday to Courtney. It's her birthday today.
If it's on, is that on? This morning in intercession, there was a word that could have been personal, but I felt like it could be for all of us. And it's open. Yay. You know, I don't know how to do this. Good God. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy. <laughs> anyway, in intercession this morning, there was thought to be a personal word, but it seemed to me to be a universal word, and it seemed to go with what Todd was speaking on. Just really an all-purpose thing, but it, to be really alert for any root of bitterness that might come up in our own lives. Be real careful to do battle in your own hearts where the enemy might have been putting a fence or roots there. Just do battle, look to it, take it to the Lord, ask for his light, you know, just do the good cleansing thing like you would in cleaning a room and just ask him to give you his purpose, you know, forgiveness and to, to change your heart. But, um, but I, just, I just pray that. That seemed to go along with us. So thank you for your grace. Nobody else was here to say it. There you go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Courtney and the Happy birthday to you.